Hey everybody, this is Irish Aura again. Um, sorry it's been a little while. Haven't been feeling the best, but I thought I'd continue our story, and we are reading The Voyage of the Great Titanic, The Diary of Margaret and Brady. Um, <clears throat> we left off with Chapter 1, Part 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, last part we read was that she had gone, she was going to the city, and the last verse, or line we read was, The hour grows late and I am tired, so I think I will tell of our city adventure in the morning. <coughs> I'm sorry, a bit, a bit of a cold. So here we go. Chapter 1, Part 2. Friday, the 29th of March, 1912, St. Abernathy's Orphanage for Girls, Whitechapel. None of the sisters felt I ought to be wandering the streets by myself, which was why Sister Catherine was to accompany me. There was great concern about what I should wear on our jaunt to the city, since they wanted very much for me to make a good impression. As a rule, the sisters' only concern is that our clothing is clean. We wear, we wear very plain, simple dresses and do our best to keep them in good, good condition. Some of the merchants in Petticoat Lane donate their cast-offs to the orphanage, but they are, of course, not top-quality garments. In the end, it was decided that I would wear a dark blue frock, which once belonged to one of the older girls. Sister Celeste arranged my hair neatly, and I, I used a soft cloth to rub a bit of shine into my but, button boots. Perhaps it goes without saying that Sister Catherine wore her habit. I was eager to take the underground, since I had scarcely ever traveled that way. But instead, we rode on a motor bus to Piccadilly Circus. Sis Sister Catherine was strangely nervous and silent, so I spent my time staring out the window. When I was very small, m Mummy and Father would take us to the city once in a great while. I remember a picnic in Regent's Park, and another day when we stood and stared at Buckingham Palace with great admiration. Piccadilly was crowded with enticing food stalls, street performers, and other lovely sights. I was very hungry, and the vendors cries of hot meat pies and taters a lot made my stomach rumble. Many a man passing by raised his hat to Sister Catherine and murmured, Afternoon, sister, before continuing on his way. Sister Catherine was very concerned that we would lose our way, and she stopped to ask of Bobby for directions. I knew only that we were going to a fine hotel in Mayfair to meet a rich American lady for tea. We walked for several blocks, turning right and left and right again. I wanted to tarry on Seville Row to scrutinize the windows of its exclusive clothing stores, but Sister Catherine felt that we had no time to linger. As we walked vigorously, I enjoyed watching the fine ladies and gentlemen strolling about with, with pet, pretty parasols and mahogany walking sticks. The ladies wore the most astonishing hats. Perhaps my frock was too humble for the likes of Mayfair. The name of the hotel was Claridge's, and it looked so fancy that I was shy about going inside. Sister Catherine had stopped, so she felt timid, too. Margaret Ann, she said, sounding terribly serious, I must remind you that there are times when it is best to sit quietly and merely listen. I am afraid I am often so eager to be clever that I speak without thinking. Then Sister Catherine is cross when she calls me saucy girl. This always makes me laugh, and then she is even more cross. Nary a word, I promised. Remember, she is American, Sister Catherine said. Be kind. I nodded. I have heard that Americans have simply dreadful accents, and tend to be lacking in characteristics like reserve and dignity. I decided for the time being to suspend my judgment. Two young men in elegant uniforms stood at either side of the entrance to the hotel. When they saw us, they promptly swung the great doors open and ushered us inside. I must admit I felt like a princess. 
never had i been in such luxurious surroundings the floors were made of marble so shiny i do believe i could see my own reflection in them a beautiful staircase loomed ahead of us and the ceiling sparkled with chandeliers sister catherine asked another uniformed man to direct us to the foyer where we were to meet miss frederick carstairs for tea the man bowed and motioned for us to come along we were taken into a lovely room where a quartet was playing live music everywhere ladies sat at small exquisite tables while graceful footmen served them tea the air was full with the sound of chamber music delicate china clinking in soft conversations we were led to a table where a plump middle-aged woman sat she was wearing an ornate flowery hat a boxy dress and long gloves all in various shades of minty green something about her posture put me in mind of a spring pigeon <laughs> that's funny seeing us she lowered her glasses and looked over looked me over with a critical eye mrs costes i am sister catherine from st abernethy's sister catherine said and may i present miss margaret ann brady mrs costes studied me and then extended her hand I was startled by her forwardness, but then reminded myself that she was, after all, American, and forced myself to return the gesture. She gave my hand, hand an abrupt shake, then dropped it. "'I am very pleased to meet you, Mrs. Carstairs,' I said, as polite as can be. I noticed then that she was holding a small and rather smug brown terrier. Although I prefer cats, I am terribly fond of all animals.' "'What a delightful pet!' I said, and reached out to stroke her. "'Don't!' Miss Carstairs said sharply, her voice loud enough to make me wince. "'She doesn't take to strangers.' By then the dog was already licking my hand. Mrs. Carstairs seemed surprised, but not displeased. Sister Catherine had the exact opposite reaction. Once we were seated, Mrs. Car and Mrs. Carstairs had told me that the dog's name was Florence, one of the uniformed footmen appeared with a steaming teapot to fill our cups. I had never seen such a glorious tea. Plate upon plate of small sandwiches, crumpets, scones, cakes, and... and... petit fours? I'm not sure what that is. I'm sorry. I am always hungry. Sister Catherine says I grow an inch every fortnight, and I wanted to eat my fill, then gather up the rest to bring back to the... to Nora, who was the youngest child at St. Abernathy's, and to whom I am quite partial. Mrs. Carstairs, Mrs. Carstairs nibbled a bite of sandwich here, and a taste of shortbread there. I tried to make each half sandwich last for three full bites, though I could easily have popped them into my mouth whole. But I knew my manners would reflect upon Sister Catherine, so I endeavored to be discreet. Cucumber salmon, roast beef, watercress, a soft white cheese, thinly sliced ham, the sandwich, the sandwich variety seemed endless. If you began to empty your plate, the cheerful footman appeared at once to replace it. Because of this, I liked him very much, and smiled broadly at him each time. However do you stay so slim? Mrs. Carstairs asked, by and by, her voice a bit stiff. I took this as a hint to restrain myself, although Sister Catherine sprang to my defense with her inch of fortnight explanation. This was followed by a brief discussion of how tall I am for my age, and Mrs. Carstairs seemed somewhat dis dismayed to discover that I am only thirteen. <coughs> Sister Catherine instantly assured her that I have always been mature beyond my years, although I will concede that there are times when that, that is probably debatable. I am surprised to find your accent so refined, Mrs. Carstairs said, seeming now to remember that I was at the table. You were so very learned. Although I had been silent for quite some time, I, I naturally assumed that meant she wanted to hear a somewhat learned remark. Oh, to be in England. <clears throat> now that's April there, I responded. Ah, Mrs. Carstairs said, although she looked uncomfortable. It was quiet for a moment, excuse me, it was quiet for a moment, and then she asked if that was 
Keats. I thought truly she was having a bit of fun with me until Sister Catherine said softly, Robert Browning. Mrs. Carstairs gave that some consideration, then remarked upon the fine job the sisters had done had done of educating me. In truth, I can rip out a right impressive string of cockney as only befits one born in, in, in Wapping. That would singe the ears of a sailor, but I have also never found it difficult to mi mimic the accents of others. Mummy always said I had a fine ear and might well be musical were I ever, were I ever to get the opportunity to learn an instrument. The pianoforte, she, she hoped. I enjoy music and would have been happy with the mouth organ. Once, Father found me a penny whistle, upon which I blew nonstop until Mommy decided to put it away for a time. Father had a beautiful light brogue, and often, when we spoke, he would lapse into my own. This gave him no end of amusement, and I hope pleasure. He was very proud of his roots, County Cork in Ireland, to be sure, and he told me many wonderful stories about the old country and the wondrous sights to be found there. Sister Eulalia, had, who grew up a very proper young lady in Kensington, has always been very strict about our pronunciation. H's, she says in snappish tones. I want to hear your H's. Then one of my classmates will promptly say, Sure. And it's an heavenly de hout, isn't it? Whereupon Sister Eulalia puts her head upon her desk. Often I cannot resist speaking to her in the broadest, most mangled cockney imaginable. She tells me that I am very, very wicked, and then slaps the ruler across my knuckles to punctuate the scolding. This may not bode well for my future as a pianoforte virtuoso. You have a pleasant demeanor, Miss Carstairs said then, but I sense mischief about you. I wanted to laugh, but I knew that would only confirm her suspicions. So I lowered my head in a shy manner and quietly sipped some tea. I was still very hungry, but, but confined myself to a small piece of sponge cake. After a time, it was decided that I should take Florence for a short walk while Sister Catherine and Mrs. Carstairs spoke privately. The dog I saw now wore a jeweled collar and a light pink silken lead. I took her out through the opulent lobby, and we wandered up to Bond Street before returning. Florence had a sprightly gait, and she seemed to enjoy barking at everyone and, and everything we passed. I cannot imagine why, for example, I'm sorry, I cannot imagine why she, for example, found the gas lamps objectionable. But to her credit, she was a spirited animal, if foolishly small. When we returned to the foyer, Sister Catherine and Mrs. Carstairs were still speaking in low, serious voices. Remarkably bright child, Sister Catherine was saying, and very congenial. Given the charming tenor of the conversation, I was loath to interrupt. However, they had stopped at once when they saw me. Upon entering the hotel, Florence had jumped up into my arms, where she was now lounging happily. Mrs. Carstairs looked at us and seemed to make up her mind. Margaret Ann, would you like to go to America? she asked. I wanted nothing more. I should be delighted, I said. And that was the end of Chapter 1, Part 2. Um... Let's see, next time we're together, we will read, next time we're together, we will read on uh, Saturday, March 30th, 1912, at St. Abernathy's Orphanage. We'll be back at the Orphanage um, next time. Thank you, and have a good day. <laughs>